But today I'm going to talk about nutrition and brain development because you were already uh, uh, talking in the, in the introduction about the high rates of premature birth, also the high mortality rates. Um, but I think that one of the most important issues that we are um, able to address as neonatologists or as, as people who are working on the neonatal intensive care unit is the long-term effects. So uh, after survival, how do those infants that are taken care of in the neonatal intensive care unit are ending up at the end? And if I ask a parent, and I do rounds every day, if I ask parents, um, then they, of course, they think that, uh, uh, that survival is the most important thing. But the, the second question that comes up is that they are very interested in how their child will be growing up. Will their child be able to go to school? Will their child be able to play in the soccer team of their village or wherever they live? So that is important. And what I'm going to show you today is that uh, nutrition is so important uh, for that role and that nutrition is something that you can control. You can control what uh, the amount and what the type of nutrition is that the infants will get on your neonatal intensive care units. Um, and these children are not able to drink themselves predominantly, only from 32 weeks onwards, they're able to do so. So you are uh, the one that um, influences the future of uh, these infants. Is this now a new development? Is it new data? Well, no, not at all. Here you can see that in 1929, there were already uh, studies looking at later mental uh, development of artificially fed and breastfed infants showing an effect of uh, types of nutrition in the first few months of life on later outcome, on later IQ. And if you are thinking about the effects of uh, nutrition and then malnutrition in particular on growth of the human brain, where of course your IQ comes from, it's very clear from several studies that severe early malnutrition has an effect on brain growth. So on brain weight, on the amount of protein that is in the brain, on the amount of DNA, on the amount of RNA, all those uh, um, um, components in the brain are affected by malnutrition. And this is a study from 1969. And so we're going way back to the previous century, where you show that here in Chile, in South America, infants that died from severe malnutrition during the first year have lower brain weights than infants that had normal nutrition had lower RNA, DNA, and also lower protein content. And since DNA and weight ratio was the same, it suggests that it's just a matter of less cells in the brain, already known in 1969. Here, another study here again from South America, or Middle America, Mexican, infants less than two years, and they, they looked at dendritic spines or from cortical neurons. And you can see clearly that the malnourished infants have lower amounts. And here also in this picture, you can see uh, uh, pictures of apical dendrites, all showing that the number and the effort lengths of those spines are being reduced when uh, looking in infants that died from severe malnutrition compared to uh, infants who died from other causes. What else do we now know from slightly uh, more advanced studies? And these are observational studies. You can see here, if you look at male infants, male preterm infants, and this is about 2,000, even over 2,000 infants born at a gestational age between 24 and 32 weeks. So usually 32 weeks or so usually less than 1500 grams. But if you're looking at 
how they are growing within the hospital. So weight set score change from birth till discharge. If you lose standard deviation scores like minus two, the odds ratio of having a suboptimal outcome in boys is about three to four times higher than uh, of infants that are not losing any weight during their uh, time at the neonatal intensive care. Of interest is, of course, that males are more affected than, in fe than females. And I come back to that in, a, in some of the later slides. So suboptimal uh, uh, growth during the neonatal intensive care increases your risk of having a suboptimal neurodevelopmental outcome. Is this in this study only? No, this is a complicated slide, but it shows many, many different uh, studies. I think these are about 25 studies listed here. And I'm gonna show you, I explain it a bit, what the effect is, what is shown here, the effect of weight gain rates on later cognition. So here you have on the y-axis, all the different 25 studies, six of them, are randomized controlled trials, and 19 of them are observational trials. On the x-axis, you see the time that infants were measured for their cognition. So most of them were measured at 12 months or 24 months of corrected age, some of them at five years, and even one of them at age 19. If there was a positive relationship, a correlation of weight gain rates and later uh, cognition, the color of the bar is red. When there is no significant association, the color of the bar is gray. And what you can see is, first of all, there are not that many randomized control trials that are out there, only six, only looking at except for this one at uh, uh, um, really uh, short-term uh, cognition outcomes. But if you just look at that vaguely to this study, you see that there is either a positive or no significant association, and there's never a, a, a negative association. So from this picture, you can see that on average, most uh, observational trials, but also some uh, randomized control trials do find an influence of weight gain rates on later cognition. The same accounts for head circumference. It's the same setup of this, uh, this systematic review. Again, six RCTs and 19 observation studies. Basically, you see that if head circumference is is, uh, is at a high rate, uh, if the gain of head circumference is at a high rate, it has a positive association with later cognition. So in hospital growth is associated with later outcome. If you also look at how growth is, uh, is, uh, is happening during the neonatal intensive care uh, um, period, you can see that there is a huge development of the brain. Here you see a completely flat, flat brain at around 26, 28 weeks, and it has to, to grow and develop to a brain that looks like this. If you look at cortical surface, here you see the huge amount of growth that takes place of, of uh, infants um, during the last trimester of pregnancy. Also, volume is increasing dramatically during the last trimester. And the last trimester is the phase that those infants are in your care. If you look more specifically to what kind of functions are, are, are happening and are, are, are developing during that uh, last trimester, you see there's lots of neuromigration taking place in mid and third uh, trimester. Myelinization starts at 28 weeks of gestation. Synaptogenesis is taking place from about 20 weeks of gestation and continues until adolescence. 
like the myelinization, and apoptosis, which some people always say, well, that's not a good sign, but we need some degree of apoptosis, uh, is also taking place at uh, the last trimester and continues throughout the first months of life. So whenever anything is happening to a specific infant, let's say at 28 weeks or 27 weeks, you will not find a specific effect of that ins insult on your myelinization rates. You will find, for instance, a bleeding in the uh, uh, subepidemial uh, spaces. If that is occurring at 24 or 26 weeks, you will find a huge damage of the neurons that are, are there uh, and migrating to the uh, peripheral uh, part of your brains. Whereas if there is a bleeding in the subepidemial spaces at uh, 32 or 34 weeks, those neurons are already dis has already been disappeared from that space. So the, the damage that a grade one IVA will have is, is very limited on 32 to 34 weeks. Whereas it might be very dramatic effects uh, at 24 weeks of life. So this is important to remember that every insult in a certain time of gestation will might have a different effect. And if you look at growth of third trimester uh, brains, when you compare those with in utero healthy fetuses, you can see again, and this is from 75 uh, preterm infants now from the US, you can see that they're lacking behind. If you look at the, at the, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the volumes of the cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, total brain volume, looking at, at uh, MRI images, you see that those parts of the brain or the whole brain is, growth is reduced in utero when compared, uh, in, in, in the NICU when compared to utero. And these are studies from only five years ago. So if you think about a uh, brain in injury, we usually think as neonatologists, well, it's asphyxia, it's ischemia, it is, has, has, is related to inflammation, so sepsis or necrotizing anticolitis. And that's all true. Cytokines that circulating in your plasma or in the plasma of those infants are damaging the brains at that specific time on that specific uh, development phase. But one of the other major injuries is suboptimal nutrition. It's the most common injury to brain of a preterm infant. And again, like I stressed before, nutrition is something that is not very fancy. A ventilation is more fancy, but how frequent does it occur in your unit that some of the nurses tell you, well, this baby has a, has a, has a distended abdomen. Shall we stop the feeding for the night or something for a few hours? And then you get an interrupted feeding. And instead of a continuation of feeding, you have a suboptimal nutrition that have every time has an effect on brain development. It is a complex interplay. How outcome is related to nutrition. So like I just showed you, nutrition has a direct effect on outcome. But growth has also an effect on outcome. And of course, growth is dependent on the amount of nutrition that you provide. And growth in itself is again dependent on the disease state. So here is a baby with a necrotizing enterocolitis. If you have necrotizing enterocolitis, of course you stop the enteral nutrition supply. So that has an effect on the nutrition, which in itself might an effect on outcome, but the disease itself also has an effect on outcome. And because the child is ill, then the child is catabolic and the child will not grow appropriately. So it has an effect on growth as well. And that effect on growth will also have an effect on outcome. So it has all these factors that one has to think about on how that will affect at the end your 
neurocognitive or psychomotor development. The brain is, like I just said, is not a homogeneous organ. There are many anatomical regions, and I just explained that there are different developmental trajectories at different times. So a perinatal malnutrition might have an effect on cell proliferation or migration or apoptosis. It might have an effect on neurochemistry, on reader status, on connectivity between the different parts and different cells. It might have an effect on gliosis, on the myelinization part, on microglial dysfunction. And all these, again, will have an effect on, uh, on the physical development, on neurological deficits, on learning, memory, on behavior, on social emotional dysfunction. And here we have something different, difficult. You have this huge vulnerability. And on the other hand, the brain is a magnificent organ because it has huge plasticity. So when sometimes you see a large IVH2 in, a, in an infant, and then if you make an MRI, you see the trajectories going around this, this uh, event, this, this place where the uh, intraventricular hemorrhage was or the, 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 the ischemia was, and you see the cortical spinal tracts going through, passing that specific injured part. So this plasticity is also a magnificent uh, effect of, uh, of ability of preterm infants. What is now the problem with regard to nutrition? Well, there are basically four different problems that I see also in my unit. There is basically a lack of knowledge of which nutrients to prescribe. So the residents don't know exactly. Many of my colleagues don't know exactly. They think, well, Hans is taking care of it, so that's going to be OK. Uh, but they are still responsible in the weekends and when I'm not there or during the nights. So uh, knowledge improvement, and that's why I'm so glad that I like more than 200 people now attending it's so important that the knowledge level will increase. Then failure to prescribe is the second problem at the NICU. Um, sometimes people are just thinking, well, this, may be my, this baby might develop next, so we better stop antinutrition. This, may be, this baby may develop uh, um, acidosis, so we stop the protein uh, intake of this baby. All these things are fear from the past. They're not uh, uh, up to date anymore. So those things are important. Then the other thing that I already slightly uh, touched upon is failure to deliver, uh, to deliver what is prescribed. So stopping uh, feeding because um, a distended abdomen, while many of the infants on my unit, I think about 60 or 70%, have a distended abdomen because we're using CPAP such a, uh, in such a frequent uh, manner nowadays. So frequent disruptions that are these decisions on disruptions are being taken by the nurses or by the first year residents just to be careful. Uh, and that at the end, the cumulative deficit that occurs is, is, is huge. And then another reason, but that's not that we can help of, but it's nice to know, is that critically ill infants may just not use the provided nutrients. So that's something also, it, it doesn't help if an infant has neck and is or has a severe sepsis just to push in more nutrients because the baby just will not utilize those. Um, like I said before, these different regions are uh, in the brain are also affected by specific nutrients. And they're listed here in an excellent review paper that are that iron is important for myelinization, uh, for instance, and that specific brain regions are benefiting from the adequate amounts of iron, but also long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are in in, uh, are so important for global brain development, but also for your retina, iodine, zinc, 
copper, protein, all the factors are listed here. And I'm sure you will be provided with the slides of this talk uh, to you all. I'm happy to share them uh, that you can read again and saying, well, this is important for later development. Here I have listed some uh, components that are important for epigenetics, for methylation of specific, for instance, the glucocorticoid receptor that has a major influence on later uh, stress responses, not only in the neonatal phase, but also for the rest of the life of these children. So stress response is depending on the amount and the, the quality of the nutrition that you are prescribing during the first weeks of life. Oh, mother's milk by far is the best feeding that you can provide for those preterm infants. There are so many benefits from own mother's milk for the mother herself. It gives a reduction of ovarian and breast cancer. It reduces uh, overweight in those, in those mothers. It improves attachment, uh, which is also critical for the development and the behavior of the child later on. But foremost, it's important for in the prevention, for instance, of necrotizing enterocolitis, and also extremely important for the, the prevention of necrotizing enterocolitis. I discussed earlier the, the apparent differences between boys and girls. And this is one of the pivotal papers in the literature done in the UK when a preterm formula came on the market and Alan Lucas and his group decided to do a randomized control trial in infants less than 1850 grams, comparing the first four weeks postnatally infants who received breast milk and then added, if that was not enough, the breast milk with term formula or added with preterm formula. And the preterm formula contained more protein, more energy, more calcium, more phosphorus, higher amounts of uh, vitamins. They showed better in hospital growth in the infants that received breast milk and preterm formula as compared to the addition of term formula, less cerebral palsy, but also higher verbal IQs. And of interest is, that that was predominant or was only found in boys. And if you look at the difference, it's huge. It's more than 10 IQ points for an intervention that only lasts for four weeks. So four weeks breast milk and term formula versus four weeks breast milk and preterm formulas has an effect of 10 IQ points in boys. Of interest is, of course, that there is no effect seen of this intervention in girls. But if you look closely, girls are smarter than boys. We already know that it's always hard to tell as a, as a, as a man, but girls are really smarter than boys. And girls are also less vulnerable to nutritional deprivation. And it's been shown in this study, but also in many other studies. Um, this is the first four weeks of enteral nutrition, but also, and this is an observational study looking at protein intake intravenously. So first week protein and energy intake and one gram of protein less during your IV nutritional management per day, per kilo per day results in eight IQ points. It's a Bailey score. Uh, eight uh, IQ points at 18 months corrected age of follow-up. For energy, a similar, uh, similar about five IQ points. This is per uh, one kcal. So if you think about 10 kcals per kilo per day, 10 kcal per kilo per day in the first week of life, less results in about five IQ points less at age uh, one and a half year. So also already the first few days of life are important. And here you see the opposite. This is a, a, a small study from uh, Norway uh, done a couple of years ago, enhancing parental antral feeding in the first few uh, weeks of life, giving more protein, more uh, energy, 
uh, to those infants. And actually what you see, you see uh, improved maturation of the brain measured by MRI techniques at term age. Also improved visual perception in those infants that had a higher level of intake in the first few weeks of life. There is an apparent paradox because I was telling you that um, weight gain or growth for that matter has a positive effect on later outcome. But we also know that if you feed preterm infants with human milk as compared to formula, the human milk fed infants are growing slightly at a lower pace than those with formula. But still, if they receive uh, breast milk as compared to formula, still breast uh, feeding has its superiority clearly shown. Here you see the effects of breastfeeding at discharge and weight loss. One standard uh, weight, this is suboptimal uh, development is important, but you still, you see, if you look at the Kaufman ABC mental composite uh, processing, so again, an IQ uh, score, that despite you see that infants on breast milk have a higher chance of lower weight gain or a higher chance of weight loss, still those infants that are breastfed have a higher IQ score. So at the end, breastfeeding is more important than looking at growth in itself. And that's shown here. It's called the breastfeeding paradox. Uh, another study showing the beneficial effects of breastfeeding uh, here. This is again a seven year longitudinal studies, infants less than 30 weeks. Here you, I will show you the effects of the number of days in the first month of life that own mother's milk intake was higher than 50% of the total enteral intake and later outcome. And you can see that here at the MRI, there's an effect on deep nuclear gray matter, but if, and this is more important, at, at seven years full scale IQ, every additional day that the intake was more than 50% of O minus milk, full scale IQ was associated with a 0.5 increase. Verbal IQ 0.4, performance IQ 0.5 showing again the importance of own mother's milk in those infants. I already touched upon the long chain polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. Those in the brain are about 30 to 50% of the all brain fatty acids. And that is really important. So the brain is a, is a huge deposit, so to say, or is, a, is at a high need for uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the most important ones are the arachidonic acid and the docohexanoic acid that are listed here. It's so difficult to pronounce that DHA is far more common and ara, arachidonic is more easy to pronounce. Those are the two important uh, um, uh, long chain omega fatty acids. You need them for receptor function, but also for the fluidity of the, of the membranes, and especially DHA is important there. 80% of the DHA in the brain of term-born infants is transferred in the last trimester. So if you are born premature, it's very easy to develop a, a, a deficit in DHA. Um, so that is important to know. And here on the right-hand uh, panel, you see that uh, uh, amount in utero accretion, accretion is about 45. And if you look at how much is supplied to preterm infants, it's only half. So that might also explain why preterm infants are at risk for having brain deficits. And actually you see that also in some of the studies, these are the effect of long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid supplementation during lactation on, uh, so to the mother on the developmental outcomes of preterm infants at uh, age one and a half to three years or even later. And you see that the mental developmental index, the MDI, is improved whenever you provide infants 
uh, the mothers with PUFAS while they are lactating, so thereby increasing the amount of DHA that you're providing to those infants. So, so those kinds of interventions do have uh, success. So I'd like to end now with some conclusions and, uh, and also some questions that is, uh, is addressing the general neonatology society as such. So first of all, the conclusions. The brain is after survival, the most important topic that parents think of when looking at how will my infant grow up later. And it's very important to know that the brain undergoes a huge transformation during the stay in the neonatal hospital, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit, and also in the hospital if you go to step down units. Ischemia, inflammation, but also important is nutritional management are, are of utmost importance for this development of the brain. And ischemia is difficult to tackle, inflammation is difficult to tackle, but suboptimal nutrition is not so difficult to tackle. And that's in your hands once again. It's really iatrogenic, uh, did I uh, write down here? It's really up to the team that is taking care of these infants. And still there are questions which specific macro or micronutrients are needed when and how much, and that are, those are areas of research which could also take place and I think should take place also in your populations. It's also, important to know, and I didn't discuss it today because we just didn't have the time to it, but it's also important to know that your gut microbiome has an important effect on your brain development. So also the, the, the usage of, of probiotics are important in, in, in uh, brain development. So you can make this different in nutrition, there are many, many guidelines also from ESCON. I, I helped in contributing to those with a huge great, a team. And we really are trying to base our, our recommendations on evidence, but sometimes we don't have the evidence, but still it's nice to have a nutritional management protocol in place. And again, like I already said, more research is needed. So I uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to answer any questions after the next talk, because we're gonna do that together in the Q&A session. Thank you very much.